Good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Don Chamberlain, and I'd like to introduce the crew to you. Let's start with Mr. Donald Koch from Columbus, well, near Columbus, Ohio. Hello, everybody. And then we'll slip on down to Houston with Mr. Mike Lewis and Dana. Is Dana there tonight? No, she got the baby in the other room. She was trying to eat all my food. Okay, that's cool. She's here in spirit. We know that. And then we'll shoot on out west to um, Chandra out in California. Hello. And back to Brooklyn, me, your humble host, in little old downtown Brooklyn. I'd like to open us up with, a, or I'd like to have a word of prayer. Um, Chandra, could you open us up with a word of prayer, please? I shall. Dear Heavenly Father, we're going to be learning about mediators, mediator, the mediator, mediators tonight, and I'm sure looking forward to it, and uh, I pray that anyone listening, me listening, all of us who are participating tonight, we can just soak up your word, what it says, and, and be able to uh, really take it with us and share it with others, and they soak it in, and uh, we can do the best of what we can do. And um, I pray that, uh, you know, people out there, um, just on a random note here, it could never be too random here, though, for prayer. I, I want to pray for out, uh, people out there who are sick. Um, I pray for their full recovery. I pray for them to the, them and their families to endure and help one another um, and to bless one another. And uh, marriages out there who are working things out, I pray for them. And um, hopefully they can all work things out. And... Oh, there's so many things to pray for. Um, <laughs> I, I pray that as, as people find us and see our fellowship, I pray that we can meet new people and we can make more friends and so we can have more people that um, we can help and, and more people to help us and we can all learn from one another. And I'm looking forward to doing that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well. Tonight, Mike, could you bring up Timothy 2.5 in any version? I'm going to be reading King James here at this particular one. First Timothy 2.5, in King James, it reads, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Most of us have heard this verse or come across it many times. I'd like to share with you what Strong says about the biblical usage of this word mediator. So give me just a second here. I'm going to do a screen share on my own. And it says, okay, this is just the beginning of my blog. It says, most of us have heard or come across this verse many times, like I said. Um, I'd like to share with you what Strong says about the biblical usage of the word mediator. Can everybody see this? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Okay. Um, one, its biblical usage means one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or form a compact or ratifying a covenant. A medium of communication, an arbiter. We've all heard of arbiters. Arbiters, you know, like if there's a strike going on, they'll bring in an arbiter and he's he forces the two sides to come to an agreement. Some have suggested the translation of defense attorney would actually be the very best translation for this word mediator. To mediate means to settle disputes, strikes, etc., 
as an intermediary between two parties to reconcile two parties together. Does that sound somewhat familiar to you guys, to reconcile two parties together? Mike, can you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17? Or I'll just read it here from the blog. Therefore, if any man be a new in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled himself unto us by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's name, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To really understand the therefore in verse 17, you have to read the entire chapter. In fact, you might want to read the entire verse 4 chapter, everything that comes before this in that book, because it all works together. And because of all that he talks about in those first four chapters, we have become ambassadors for Christ. Have you ever thought about yourself as being an ambassador? What does an ambassador look like? You know, that's, that, there's a good question for you. What does an ambassador look like? Does an ambassador look like Don Culp or Chandra? <laughs> well, they are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did be, be beseech them. He came to Don and said, "Come on, Don, become become part of my family, become part of my my become one of my kids." And Don answered that clarion call. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, his mission was reconciling man to God. We are now charged to do the same. So now Jesus Christ sits as the one between us and God. For many years, I thought this was was unique to our day and time. And then someone showed me how wrong I was. Mike, can you bring up Genesis chapter 18? Yes, sir. It's up. I'm going to read. Okay, I'm going to read the first seven verses, and then um, Don Culp, will you take uh, seven through, oh, say 20, and Chandra the from 20 down. To, oh, oh, there's a lot more verses than I thought. 33, okay. I'll take the first eight verses. Uh, Mike, take 8 through 16. Don, take 16 through 24. And Chandra, take 24 through 32, 33. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, good. So let me start here. And the Lord appeared unto him, and him in this verse, you always need to know who these pronouns are about. It's talking about Abraham. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Marmi. Or hold it, Mike. I'm supposed to be reading it from. <laughs> supposed to be reading it from your, what you're sharing. Okay, the Lord appeared unto Abraham near the trees of Marmi, while he was sitting in the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he turned to the entrance to meet them and bowed to the ground. He said, If I have found favors in your eyes, my, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed. Then you can go on your way now that you've come to your servant. Very well, they said, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, quit, get three shias, which is, this is a measurement of some sort. I was told it's about a handful of flour. Get three shias of the finest flour, knead it, and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the, a calf and had them 
prepared to set before these before them while he while they ate he stood under the tree okay next where is your wife Sarah they asked there in the tent he said then one of them said I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah your wife will have a son now Sarah was listening at the tent at the entrance to the tent which was behind him Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought after I am worn out and my Lord is old will I now have this pleasure then the Lord said to Abraham why did Sarah laugh and say will I really have a child now that I'm old is there anything too hard for the Lord I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son Sarah was afraid so she lied and said I did not laugh but he said yes you did laugh okay when the men got up to leave they looked down towards Sodom ah, where'd he go so, and when the, red, the when the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of him uh, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him and the Lord said because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is coming to me and if not I will know and the men turned their faces from there and went towards Sodom but Abraham stood yet before the Lord and Abraham drew near and said wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked for adventure there be fifty righteous within the city wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein verse 25 Please had to unmute myself. Uh, far, be, <laughs> far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find forty-five there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him, what if only forty and uh, what if only forty are found there? He said, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry <laughs> Uh, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Okay. Now, there's um, a lot of stuff that goes on in, the, in this particular chapter. The last part of it is where we get into the mediator, but I did want to go over that first part, too. In verses 1 through 8, you'll notice they set up the whole hospitality thing. In the East, it was extremely important. Hospitality was considered extremely important. If a, somebody was going by your house, you'd go out, you'd offer them them to come in, you'd wash their feet, you'd get them food, you'd sit down, you'd eat with them, and you know, generally they would give you some sort of a token 
uh, a little gift of some sort to as a token of thanks. Well, you're dealing with God and two angels. So he gave Sarah the little token she wanted, the kind that cries. So um, that's what's set up in the first eight verses. And it's interesting, too, because I believe that there were Abraham's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, Abraham would have been about 98 here because the child was born when he was 99. So he would have been around 98, and Sarah would have been around 95 uh, at this point. So they're way beyond childbearing years, and here's God saying you're going to have a child. You know, I can't, and you, as much as I'd like to say that I would hope that I would have accepted what God said, I can understand where Sarah was coming from. Now the two men were both angels, and they headed out for uh, Sodom where Lot was living. In verse 18, we find that, that all nations are blessed in Abraham. In verse 20, we learn the reason for this visit. And I'm going to read this to you from the King James. Verse 20, it says, And the Lord said, Because the, Sod the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because of their, their sin is very grievous, I will go down now, and I will see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And he turned to the faces of the men, and from thence and they took off and went to Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham got between God and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham became a mediator for, you know, the defense attorney, the bargainer, the, the, the what was the other one? Um, defense attorney. The, the, the defense attorney, the arbiter. He became the Ar arbiter between between God and Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's, a, it's an interesting prayer because it's called an intercessor's prayer. And it's, a, it's an oriental custom. Um, you know, you start off saying, well, if there's 50 righteous, won't you spare this? And he goes all the way down to 10. This is a way of, of saying, in the end, that they found one righteous person, they wouldn't have destroyed the cities. They would have left them alone for one righteous man. Now, Abraham thought that was all sewed up because Lot was there. But you see, Lot had chosen to go into these places where this, the sin was just rampant in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I did a teaching a while back on the two points of view on Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the Christian point of view and the Jewish point of view. The Jewish point of view deals a lot with the hospitality. And maybe I'll do that again some night where I get into the difference between the hospitality that they should have gotten once they got to Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the lack of any hospitality at all except from Lot. But in any case, I believe it's had an effect on Lot. Uh, living in, in, in the place that he did. And uh, even though he was much better than the, the people there, I don't think that Lot was really full-fledged, all out for God. Um, you know, you can see it if you read the record that he didn't want to leave. His wife didn't want to go at all. He didn't want to leave. And these angels had to yank them out of the city because they wanted to stay. This was their home now. And, you know, after, just read that, I think it's uh, 19 or 20, where they get into all the things that happened. And, you know, the, the, the way the people were treating, and he still wanted to stay. It, it's just incredible. You have to read it. And then you can understand why I'm saying, I don't know how if Lot was all that righteous. And then you look at Lot's kids, and, you know, he had two daughters who slept with him, and the Moabs, Moab and Amoron came out of that. And that, the Moab, Moab had fathered the nation of the Moabites, and Amoron fathered the nation of the Amorites, 
And you can read through the Old Testament, and they're constantly giving Israel problems because they weren't standing with God. They weren't standing for God. They were ignoring God and just doing whatever they pleased. All right, I want to look at one more intercessor or one more arbitrator. So let's go over to Exodus chapter 32. Okay. Uh, again, I'll read the first eight verses, and then some. You know, one of you, uh, Mike, you take over, and Don, and then Sean. We'll each read like eight verses. Okay. When the people saw Moses was gone so long from coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, "Come, make us gods who will go before us." As the fellow, this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. I mean, he went up there and he's gone. Aaron answered them, take the gold earrings off your wives and your sons and your daughters and put them in. Bring them to me. So they all took off the gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed him and made them into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Fashioning, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built the altar in front of them, in front of the calf, and announced, Tomorrow will be the festival day of the, the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and went and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented uh, fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and indulged in revelry. And for those of you who don't understand what revelry is, they were basically having an orgy. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because the people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf and they bowed down and sacrificed to it and have said, these are the gods of Israel who brought us up out of Egypt. Okay, so Mike, you want to take over for go down about eight more verses or so? Yes, sir. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you a great nation. But Moses sought favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power in a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountain and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servant Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Okay, Don, go ahead. Okay, we're on verse 15. Right. All right. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other, were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Verse 19, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh or near unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf 
which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strut it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Yeah. Yeah. 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee? What did this people? What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for as for this Moses, the man that brought us out, out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it in the fire, and there came out this king. Moses saw that the people were running wild, and that Aaron had let them get out of control, and so, and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Man, that's called a war, right? That's a war. That sounds like a war to me. Okay. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. The day, the next day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods, uh, gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish... I will punish them for their sin. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and the Lord struck the people uh, with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Man, oh. so they just did that all for nothing? They like, you know what I mean? Did they kill their sons and this or that? You know, did they go through all that war and then they still get punished with the plague? I mean, hey. Old Testament thing, you know. Well, that that's a whole nother teaching too. Okay. But in, uh, in, you know, when you remove yourself from God's grace, from God's protection by doing things you're not supposed to, like breaking the first commandment, the the one that Jesus Christ said, "Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength." That's the one He's really concerned about. He doesn't want you worshiping other gods. Go ahead, Mike. I, I, just to interject a little bit, too, even though um, the, the people stood with Moses, there were still consequences for what they've done. There's exactly. lots of time, even today, when we, we change our mind on things, but some of the things that we sow in our life, we have to suffer consequences I mean, and I, and, I, and I love my family with all my heart, but I'm going to use an example. I have a young 21-year-old daughter that has a child, and she's not married. Now, we know what God's Word says about marriage and children and all that stuff, and a man and a woman and a family. Well, even though she's repented and, and she's changed her heart and she's doing her best, there's still consequences for the action that she took that was against God's revelation in the Word. So, just my two cents. Ah. Yeah. Exactly. God, you know, it's not that God doesn't forgive us, because He does. Especially in this administration. You know, we're, we've been saved by grace. But there, you know, if, if you take your car and run into a cement abutment at 100 miles an hour, 
there are going to be consequences. There's just nothing you know God can do about it. There's consequences to pay. You know, the, the there's laws and orders in the universe, and 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 most even with Christians today, I think they don't realize that they have an adversary called Satan, and he looks for he runs around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for the mistakes of Christians that he know they are legally bound to in this. Now God still can show grace and mercy and overcome it, but he and he is. God is always trying to get us out of the soup, especially when we repent and where he looks on our heart. But Satan is always there trying to make us pay for the wrong. He's the great accuser standing there. Uh, the book of Job is just wonderful on that context. Yeah, okay. Now this whole chapter is worth the read. That's why I had us read it all. <laughs> the first part of this chapter, you see the people demanding of Aaron that he make them a god of gold. It doesn't say if Aaron tried to stop them. That's an interesting thing because it never says one way or the other whether Aaron tried to stop them. I happen to personally think that he gave in at once. That is, about, however, just what I believe happened. In any case, Aaron made the idol of gold, and the people went wild and did all sorts of nasty things. It was made in the image of a calf. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about uh, the gods of Egypt, but remember, that's where Israel had been for uh, 400 years. The god, the calf god, was the god of fertility. And it was basically uh, the only way to say it is there was it was an orgy going on, everybody having sex with everybody, and there's gonna be consequences for that too. You know, it, it you know, I'm, it, it's amazing, Mike, that you brought up what you did because you had no idea I was going here. <laughs> Each god represented a different category, and if you didn't like what one god did you could always go to another god and you know the first com the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me well here's israel having their orgy and you know praying to this cow god or the calf god further states that they are stiff-necked that means that they are stubborn in their ways god calls them that many times throughout the uh, hebrew scriptures and I guess they just never learned. Then God says he's going to wipe them out and make a new nation out of Moses. And this is where Moses becomes the arbitrator between God and Israel. And Moses says, whoa, hold it. You do that. And these dudes in Egypt are going to say, hey, you just let them out into the uh, wilderness to kill them. You know, what kind of a God are you going to look like? So God didn't wipe them out. Moses was mediating between Israel and God. Moses was between God and Israel. He became the mediator. So never assume that Jesus Christ is the only mediator. As with many other things, there are indicators in the Old Testament of what Jesus Christ would become. Like you have, uh, there's another mediator I can think of just off the top of my head here. Elijah and the 800 prophets of Baal. I mean, he, Elijah stood between God and the nation of Israel again. And the nation of Israel is off worshiping all these other, uh, Baal and the prophets of the grove and all that. And uh, Moses said, make a decision. If God be God, let him be God. If Baal be God, let him be God. And nobody answered so Moses, so Elijah said, "Well, let's build the, you know, the altars and burn the calf, and whoever sends down fire, let him be God." And of course, uh, when the prophets of Baal were jumping around, screaming, cutting themselves, and blood is gushing, and you know that 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 was an intercession between Israel and God. Elijah stood there, and you know God. Israel to swing back. It doesn't mean there weren't consequences for those people who had been worshiping uh, Baal all along. So just because there's a mediator doesn't mean there won't be consequences. 
but God will do everything, like Mike was saying, God will do everything he possibly can to get us out of the soup every time. John has this great thing he um, said once. I think he says it in the class. Sometimes when he does stupid things, he just says, well, God can't wait to see how you're going to get us out of this one. And that's just absolutely the truth. God's always there trying to get all of us out of what we've done, get us out of whatever consequences are coming up. And, I mean, um, as some of you know, I, I, I had a pulmonary embolism. Uh, that was, there were a lot of reasons for that, the least of which was not that I didn't take care of myself. I mean, I, I'd done a lot of dumb things and didn't go to a doctor when I needed to, and I ended up very sick. And, you know, these are just things to always be considered when you're, when you're dealing with things. You know, is what are the potential rewards and what are the potential consequences? Because you're going to have to deal with that no matter what you do in life. There are either, there is going to be rewards and there are going to be consequences. So what you have to decide is do the rewards outweigh the consequences? But we've already made one decision and it's set in stone and there's nothing we can do about it now. But, you know, even now we have to keep renewing our minds. We have to keep changing our thinking. And that, that can be the most difficult thing in the world is to change your thinking. Anybody got anything they want to say about this whole idea of the mediator? No, I think you brought up a great point. Uh, I mean, you could take that teaching all the way through the Old Testament, Don, because oh. the people that stood up and said they're going to stand for God... Uh, to bring whatever group of David in his day, and I mean, right. uh, you, you brought up Elijah, and uh, uh, they're just, and they were all uh, shadows of the Lord that would come. They were all trying to imitate what they saw, the Redeemer that would finally come, being Jesus Christ. I think that's a fantastic point. Yep. Right, and it was all indicators and there were so many things in the old or in the Hebrew scripture I gotta quit calling it the Old Testament They're the Hebrew scriptures there's so many indicators of what Jesus Christ would become or there are things that turned into prophecies about Jesus Christ that you would never think was a prophecy like when God says I have called my son out of Egypt he was speaking directly about Israel, but he was also speaking metaphorically about Jesus Christ years later that he called them out of Egypt. So that's why we say in this ministry, everything is in, points towards Jesus Christ. And from Genesis 3.15 on, the written word is about Jesus Christ. So Chandra, Don, anything you wish to contribute before we close it out? What's cool is the Old Testament was Jesus' textbook that told him who he was and what he was supposed to do because of who he was and what he would get if he did because what he was supposed to do because of who he was. I think I can say it. <laughs> it was all in there. Yeah, and I, um, what Michael is mentioning, I mean, well, what you, you know, what you all mentioned. As far as still having to bear the consequences of the things that you do, and, you know, Michael used someone from his family. I mean, I can use myself pretty much in the same shoes, you know, as, as your daughter, Michael, because um, it's it's a good thing that I, you know, I, I changed my way of thinking of how to, you know, uh, pick a man, uh, <laughs> whatever, and because uh, that's a big uh, it's a big, it makes a big difference. <laughs> so, but at the same time, you know, it's not like I still, I can't, I can't not have the consequences to deal with that I, you know, I made, like I already made those, I made those precious human beings, you know, I, I did what I did and it's not like I was a horrible person for it or whatever, but this is my responsibility now. And so I just, you know, I went with it and it was hard. But boy, oh boy, I'm so glad that I changed my way of thinking because life would have been a lot harder if I didn't change my way of thinking. So, so even though it's not like he, it's not like he erased what 
you know, it's like, oh, that's okay, Chandra, good job for changing your mind and, and, and being a good girl now. Okay, let's just get rid of your, you, you know what I mean? He, can't, he didn't do that, but at the same time, I'm being blessed from here on out. You know what I mean? It's like I'm being blessed, like I'm being helped. I'm being helped with what, whatever my consequence has been, you know, I've been helped along the way to deal with it. So That's grace and mercy. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the grace and mercy there, and I'm very grateful <laughs> for that. My children are a lot better off that way too. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay, John Kelp, would you close this out with a word of prayer? Yes. Father, I thank you for this wonderful teaching we've heard this evening. Thank you for all the mediators that came before, and I thank you for the mediator of all time, your Son Jesus Christ, who is mediating for us at this very moment. Thank you for each person who's listening to this. I thank you for blessing them exceeding abundantly. And I thank you for a wonderful time in the Word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 So, Don, why don't you say good night? Good night, everybody. And, Michael? Good night. Thank you. Okay, say it again because you weren't on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Good night and thank you. <laughs> okay, there you go. Chandra? Good night. Be blessed. Okay. Good night, everybody. And y'all, everything's backwards with this camera. Oh, yeah. Right, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>